This hearing on U.S. policy and democracy in Latin America and the Caribbean will come to order. In March, this committee hosted the Organization of American States Secretary General Luis Amalgro to review the state of democracy in the region. We heard concerns about the uptick in fraudulent elections, shrinking space for civil society and independent media, efforts to politicize judicial institutions, and the loss of hope in a region plagued by insecurity and kleptocracy. While the Inter-American Democratic Charter marked its 20th anniversary in September, the harsh reality is that we are witnessing a fraying of democratic consensus in the Americas. Given Secretary General Amalgro's diagnosis, it is critical that the Biden administration continue efforts to restore the defense of democracy as a central pillar of U.S. foreign policy. In his June memorandum, the president made it clear that combating kleptocracy is a U.S. national security priority, and American diplomats are again using the language of human rights. After four years of the Trump administration failing to stand up for our fundamental values, we have acutely felt the effects, and these initial steps are welcome. But we must do more, because the truth is that since March, the situation in the hemisphere has become even more challenging. In Cuba, the Diaz Canal regime attacked, detained, and disappeared its citizens for demanding fundamental freedoms during unprecedented countrywide protests in July. The regime paired physical assaults with internet shutdowns and decrees criminalizing free expression on social media. Terrified of the Cuban people's desire for change, it militarized the entire island to prevent protests in November. While I welcome the administration's four rounds of targeted sanctions, we must move more aggressively to hold security forces accountable. And we must launch a strategic effort to demilitarize the Cuban economy in parallel with our support for the Cuban people. In Nicaragua, the Ortega's regime relentless campaign to jail and persecute political opponents, civil society, and independent media resulted in the recent sham elections. This month, Congress passed my bipartisan Renacer Act, ushering a new era of international accountability. I'm pleased that the Biden administration is already implementing the Renacer Act with new targeted sanctions and a blanket visa ban on Nicaraguan officials complicit in the dismantling of democracy, the toughest measures Ortega has ever faced. In Haiti, following President Moise's assassination, gangs now control large parts of the country and kidnap and terrorize civilians, including American missionaries and children. I look forward to hearing how the administration is working to restore security, facilitate dialogue between civil society and political actors, and help chart a Haitian-led path to new elections to overcome this chaos. Since March, the Maduro regime has continued its campaign of torture, disappearances, arbitrary jailings, and manipulation of essential supplies in order to subjugate the Venezuelan people. It has walked away from negotiations with the National Unity Platform, talks that could help address urgent humanitarian needs and set the country on a path towards recovery. Instead, the regime prioritized holding deeply flawed elections that no credible democratic actor has called free and fair. We have observed the surgical deconstruction of El Salvador's justice system as President Bukele appears intent on taking the training wheels off his autocratic project. And in Brazil, President Bolsonaro is plagiarizing the Trumpian playbook by invoking the specter of political violence and fraud in advance of next year's elections. It's no wonder given the state of democracy in the Americas, that irregular population movements are at an all-time high. Our hemisphere is at a critical inflection point. We must help democracies deliver, especially as they recover from the economic and social impact of the pandemic. We must continue supporting civil society efforts to reverse democratic black backsliding. We must help pro-democracy movement harness the power of technology to confront dictatorships. The upcoming Summit for Democracy presents an opportunity to coalesce around a global strategy to confront repressive regimes and strengthen democracies. It's my sincere hope that it produces tangible outcomes. 
As we said in March, the cost of inaction is too great, and it is increasingly exponentially. When democracies in the Americas fail to provide their people, those looking for a better life will come knocking at the door. And if we do not increase our engagement in the hemisphere, others from further away, China, Russia, will be only too happy to gain a stronger foothold to exploit tensions and divisions. I look forward to discussing these and other issues as it relates to the hemisphere to this hearing. And now let me turn to the ranking member for his remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the United States has had an enduring interest in a stable and, pro and prosperous Western Hemisphere, and the democratic order is the best guarantor uh, of those things. The people of Latin America and the Caribbean have made great strides toward democratic governance over the last several decades. However, it's disheartening to see how quickly that progress can be lost. Nicaragua joins Cuba on a seemingly bottomless descent in, into authoritarianism, Within less than a generation, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro have turned Venezuela into a failed state. Last year, candidate uh, Biden promised to use smart, smart sanctions and greater multilateral pressure on the Maduro regime. Ten months in, President Biden has, uh, has not imposed a single sanction on the regime or any its, of its cronies. And the European Union is not any closer to matching the economic and diplomatic pressure brought forth by the United States and Canada. Equally concerning is the negative effect of malign state actors such as China and Russia. China's predatory economic practices are a formidable threat to the sovereignty of countries in the Western Hemisphere. The adoption of, technologi of technologies developed and controlled by firms vulnerable to Chinese Communist Party pressure undermines privacy and human rights. Russian disinformation campaigns exacerbated the uh, protests that rocked democratic countries in South America in 2019, including Colombia, Chile, and Ecuador. Putin openly endorses increasingly authoritarian rulers with the goal of destabilizing the region and threatening its security. And Russia's export of repressive laws and practices to its allies in Latin America allows authoritarian leaders to suppress independent media, civil society, and political opposition. Lastly, criminal and foreign terrorist organizations are malign threats to the safety of both our communities here at home and democracies in the region. The administration's plan to remove the FARC from the foreign terrorist list undermines U.S. national security and democratic stability in Colombia. As this administration plans for its upcoming Summit for Democracy next month, I'm glad to see numerous countries from the region invited. I hope this summit is more than just a ceremony of words and hollow promises and instead will produce real results to improve democracy and rule of law across the region. I look forward to hearing from our witness about, uh, witnesses about all of these important issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with our panel. Um, we are pleased to have uh, Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere, Brian Nichols, uh, who previously has served as ambassador in various locations, including in Peru. Uh, was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, um, and uh, also was the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Colombia, so he's very well familiar with the hemisphere. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. And we also have uh, the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, Todd Robinson, who previously has served in a variety of positions the Senior Advisor for Central America in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs was previously the Charge d'Affaires in Venezuela. Uh, and so uh, both of our witnesses have uh, significant deep experience in the hemisphere, which we appreciate to draw from. So we'll start off with Secretary Robinson. We'd ask you to uh, have your testimony be summarized in about five minutes or so. Your full statements will be entered into the record without objection. And Mr. Secretary, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for calling this hearing and bringing attention to the issue of erosion of democracy in Latin America. I am pleased to be here today with uh, my friend and colleague, Assistant Secretary Nichols, with whom I am working closely to address the challenges raised by the issue. Democratic institutions that effectively and adequately meet their citizens' needs are critical building blocks in this region. 
Supporting democratic norms and transparent institutions is something we should all support. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, I was expelled from Venezuela in 2018 for speaking out against the Majuro regime's illegitimate elections and corrupt governance. Before that, in 2015, I saw firsthand as Guatemalan citizens demanded the investigation and prosecution of corrupt officials, including their president. <coughs> I am no stranger to the threats facing democracy in this region. I'm clear-eyed about the challenges, but I am also confident that working with our colleagues across the department and the interagency, my team in the, in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, INL, is well positioned to address them. Throughout the Western Hemisphere, endemic corruption drives authoritarianism, irregular migration, crime, and violence. Corrupt government actors and other elites are incentivized to allow drug trafficking and other organized criminal groups to operate, driving instability and contributing to undemocratic practices. The Biden-Harris administration is moving to protect and reinvigorate democracy both at home and abroad. And INL is working to build capacity to fight the cycle of corruption and our efforts span the region. In Colombia, INL supported prosecutors and police are helping root out corruption and enable greater transparency. In Mexico, our partnership helps strengthen the capacity of security and justice institutions to reduce opportunities for corruption, prosecute offenders, and promote a culture of accountability. However, we must recognize some governments lack the ability or frankly the political will to tackle corruption. Indeed, many of these governments and their elites are benefiting from it. Our strong preference is to work with governments, but ultimately we can't want this more than them. As Secretary Blinken testified in June, if governments are unable or unwilling to do what's necessary, we will increase our work with civil society, local communities, and international organizations and trusted partners in the private sector, particularly if they are willing to fight corruption rather than seeking to benefit from it. We strongly support efforts by watchdog groups and investigative media outlets to expose corruption, advocate for justice and democratic institutions, and support anti-corruption reforms in their countries. No one understands the corrosive nature of corruption better than those whose livelihoods suffer because of it. In Venezuela, the cycle of violence, crime, and corruption has eroded the democratic process, the economy, and the security situation. In response, the department to date has issued 13 transnational organized crime and narcotics rewards offers for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Maduro and his cronies. We have also designated three individuals under Section 7031C of the Department of State Foreign Operations and Related Appropriations Act who abuse their public position in the region by accepting bribes and kickbacks and misappropriating public funds for their own self-enrichment. We have also taken similar actions in Central America in places like Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and we will, continue, we will continue to do so. In Haiti, weak institutions and pervasive corruption contribute to the proliferation of gang violence, including kidnappings for ransom. Gangs control nearly half of Port-au-Prince and key transportation infrastructure. When I was in Haiti two weeks ago, I met with the Prime Minister, the Acting Minister of Justice, the new Director General of, Poli of Police, and, and our international partners to emphasize our concern for the security situation and discuss INL's plan to support, plan support to help the Haitian National Police uh, establish a tactical anti-gang unit. I stress the need to ensure uh, officer accountability within the HMP respect for human rights and transparency, particularly for the HMP anti-gang unit. And INL will continue to support longer-term community prevention efforts and institutional capacity building of the HMP, including through additional embedded advisors, vehicles, and protective equipment for HMP units countering gangs and supporting election security. Mr. Chairman, I will end my testimony reiterating an important point. 
The political will of partners is absolutely critical. Even the best resourced intervention cannot succeed if our partners are not equally or more committed to the challenge. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Secretary Nichols. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding our efforts to promote inclusive democracy in the Americas. Two decades ago, we and our Western Hemisphere partners committed to promote and defend democracy across the region through the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Following that historic commitment, the region's democracies enjoyed a period of relative prosperity, security, and stability. Unfortunately, too many ordinary citizens in the region's democracies saw their governments failing to meet their aspirations for a better future. Street protests broke out in several countries in 2019 as citizens expressed anger and frustration with political and economic elites. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted and exacerbated the region's underlying governance challenges. As Secretary Blinken said in his October 20th remarks in Ecuador, we find ourselves in a moment of democratic reckoning. And the question for all of us who believe in democracy and believe its survival is vital to our shared future is, what can we do to make democracies deliver on the issues that matter most to people? Our defining mission in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs is answering that question and doing all we can to deliver the benefits of democracy to the nations of the Americas. We know elements of the answer already. To strengthen democracy, we must use every diplomatic, economic, and moral tool available to combat corruption, enhance civilian security, improve government service delivery, and address the economic and social challenges facing the region's citizens. We work across all these fronts daily with partners across the globe. We hold corrupt actors accountable, including through visa restrictions, economic sanctions, and naming more than 60 individuals in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras to the Section 353 Corrupt and Undemocratic Actors List. We will expand on our commitment to fight corruption as host of the Ninth Summit of the Americas next year. To strengthen civilian security, the United States invests billions of dollars globally to reduce violence and combat transnational criminal organizations. We laid the groundwork for more comprehensive approaches to security at the October 8th High-Level Security Dialogue with Mexico and the October 21st High-Level Dialogue with Colombia. We will adopt similar approaches with other partners. We must also address the economic and social challenges facing our citizens as together we recover from the pandemic. In partnership with COVAX and bilaterally, we have donated more than 54 million doses to 30 countries in the hemisphere. The United States has invested more than $10 billion in Latin America and the Caribbean through the Development Finance Corporation to help the region restart its economy. The President's Build Back Better World Initiative will frame our efforts moving forward. We must work tirelessly to support democracy where the undemocratic regimes prevail. We support the unity platform in Venezuela and their demand for human rights and democracy. Nicolas Maduro should release wrongfully detained U.S. nationals immediately so that they can return to their families. In Nicaragua, following the sham November 7 elections, the administration sanctioned 40 individuals and nine entities under our Nicaragua-specific or global Magnitsky programs. We imposed visa restrictions on 169 people linked to the Ortega Murillo government. We announced a, a presidential proclamation on Nicaragua suspending the entry of individuals complicit in undermining democracy. We welcome the strong bipartisan Reina Serra legislation and look forward to working closely with you to implement it. Our Cuba policy focuses on support for the Cuban people and accountability for Cuban government officials involved in human rights abuses. Working with the international community, we condemn the violence and repression perpetrated by the Cuban regime. Since July, the Treasury Department has imposed four rounds of targeted financial sanctions against Cuban officials and entities within the Cuban military and security services, imposing tangible consequences against repressors and promoting accountability for the human rights abuses. The administration also supports efforts to counter internet censorship. 
We will continue to work with the private sector and other stakeholders to identify viable options to ensure greater internet access for the Cuban people. We see these and other challenges confronting the region, but we stand by our conviction that democracy remains the best form of government to address them. The President will host the Summit for Democracy on December 9th and 10th, where we will take on bold new commitments to fight corruption, defend against authoritarianism, and promote respect for human rights, both at home and abroad. And I'm honored to partner with INL and my friend Todd Robinson, uh, its Assistant Secretary, in that effort. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both for your testimonies. We'll start a series of five-minute rounds. Uh, Secretary Nichols, uh, the Cuban limit, uh, let's talk about some of these things specifically. The Cuban military has long claimed that it draws its power from the people. Yet Diaz-Canal, like the Castros before him, is using the military to perpetrate the Communist Party's stranglehold, uh, stranglehold on the Cuban people and stifle democratic openings. The regime militarizes the island to shut down peaceful protests and continues expanding the military's control of the Cuban economy, fueling the rise of a new generation of military oligarchs in the process. Now, the Biden administration rightly designated Defense Minister Lopez Miera under global Magnitsky sanctions, but it's become clear that the problem is bigger than one general. So let me ask you, do we agree that the Cuban military has an expansive control of the economy? Uh, which stifles out, uh, for example, independent entrepreneurs trying to get a foothold in the country's economy? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. The role of the Cuban military, uh, MINFAR, GAESA, in dominating the economy and controlling the largest businesses and placing itself in a position to suck up resources that go into different parts uh, of the country uh, is of great concern. Uh, the military's role in repressing uh, citizens who seek only to exercise their fundamental rights of free speech uh, assembly uh, has been documented um, for decades, uh, and everything that we can do to prevent that uh, conduct, uh, I think, will be important. So we agree what the role they're playing is a rather nefarious role, but what steps will the Biden administration take to increase accountability for the military's role in repression and to facilitate the demilitarization of the Cuban economy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, administration continues to look at specific individuals to sanction under uh, the full range of our authorities. We look to block resources from moving into military-controlled organizations and uh, companies, uh, and we will continue to prevent uh, military individuals from traveling, uh, and we'll work with allies and partners around the world to highlight the abuses that the Cuban military perpetrates on its populace. Now, there's a lot more that can be done. And there's a lot more of sanctioning that should take place uh, so that people understand that they don't get away with impunity. One of the things we should be looking at is uh, revoking the visas of a variety of Cuban military uh, and Cuban officials' families that have visas to come to the United States. It sends a very clear message that uh, we won't tolerate and give them the benefit of doing what everyday Cubans cannot do. Uh, and uh, I really would urge the administration to look, that, look at that. We have been talking for some time about how do we facilitate freedom of expression uh, inside of Cuba, particularly through the use of the Internet, and you refer to it in your testimony. Uh, I understand we have been using uh, and seen an exponential use of some tools that the department and USAGM have been working on. I won't get into the specifics because we don't want to, to give the regime greater information about them for circumvention. But why is it that we have not been able to find the pathway to greater uh, uh, widespread Internet use inside of Cuba? What, what, what are the obstacles that we are facing in that regard? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are a number of challenges with regard to Internet uh, in Cuba. The first is the amount of bandwidth that goes into the country, which is uh, quite limited. Um, if there were greater 
bandwidth overall, there would be greater ability to access it, the internet at higher speeds. Uh, the regime uses uh, a number of technologies and techniques to block internet access to individuals, to small groups of people, to specific geographic locations, uh, and actually does not typically shut down the entire internet to the island. Uh, so uh, defeating those uh, techniques and technologies uh, is an important focus of our efforts. And I'm happy to go into greater detail with you and your colleagues uh, in a restricted setting. No, but there's been suggestion that if we did satellite, if we tethered balloons, if we did a variety of other things, that we could more successfully get access to the internet for the Cuban people. We've researched those, and, and uh, the challenge is bandwidth on the island. Is that what you're saying? That's one of the challenges, but projecting a, a, a wireless signal into the island, either from a balloon or an aircraft or uh, from a static location, uh, when the Cuban authorities would be actively trying to jam that signal, uh, presents a significant technological challenge. And again, I'm happy to go into greater detail on that. Let me close on Venezuela. Uh, my... Uh you know, we, I think the uh, administration has rightfully claimed the recent elections as a sham election. Um, I believe other countries have also joined in calling it such. I'm really concerned about, uh, you know, the purposes of uh, uh, EU Commissioner Borrell's intentions uh, a, a leaked EU memo showed that he ignored recommendations from his own staff not to send an observation mission to Venezuela. And if we want a credible alternative to the Borrell report about all the flaws and manipulations of elections in Venezuela, it has to be prepared by a, a credible organization. Uh, can, can you confirm for us today that the United States does indeed support a negotiated solution is codified in the Verdad Act and make equally clear that any recalibration of U.S. sanctions will be tied to concrete results at the negotiating table? Yes, Mr. Chairman, and in fact, I'll be meeting with members of the Unitary Platform this afternoon. Now, Interim President Guaido and the National Unity Platform have shown their willingness to participate in negotiations to restore democracy and the rule of law in Venezuela. However, in a sign of bad faith, Maduro suspended the talks in October because he's upset about someone who was apprehended by the U.S. Justice uh, Department uh, who may spill the goods on him. Uh, so it, it shows where we're at with Maduro. I hope the world recognizes that. Uh, my understanding is that interim President Guaido has been invited to the Summit of Americas. Is that, I mean, the Summit uh, of Democracies. Is that true? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chairman, and he'll have a speaking role with that event. All right. Thank you very much. Senator Rich. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder uh, if both of you could speak to the fact uh, that uh, uh, in the last presidential campaign, uh, then-candidate Biden had promised uh, sanctions uh, on Maduro and the regime, and nothing's happened in this 10, ten months. Can you explain that? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Rich. Uh, we continue to uh, support a negotiated uh, process uh, in Venezuela. When uh, we have uh, the uh, information regarding uh, actions of certain individuals, uh, we take action uh, to use all of the authorities that we have been given. Uh, we believe that the crucial elements in the way forward is the negotiation process, and hopefully the Maduro regime will return to the table promptly. Well, what, what information are you looking for? Every time we talk to the administration about this, they say, oh, well, we're working on it, and we're looking for information. Uh, what, what information are you looking for, and on, on what individuals? It's our goal to um, collect comprehensive uh, and detailed information on the actions of government actors uh, that violates U.S. law or international norms uh, and uh, that will withstand uh, judicial scrutiny. What information are you looking for? 
Well, it would be participation in human rights violations. And you don't have any information on in that? In acts of corruption. Um, those, are, those are the types of areas where we seek information. Do you plan on, on doing any, uh, any sanctions at all in the near future? Uh, the administration has aggressively used the sanctions authorities available, and I expect that we will continue to use so, do so. Okay. Do you want to comment on this? No, I would, I would just uh, uh, add that uh, I don't think uh, the previous administration or the current administration are uh, holding bank back on using sanctions, uh, certainly not against uh, uh, members of the Maduro regime. Um, and we intend to continue to do that. Were either one of you uh, consulted on uh, removing FARC uh, uh, from uh, the list, uh, the terrorist list? Yes, the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs uh, uh, was consulted and, and played a role in the uh, listing of the FARC uh, EP and the Segunda Marquetalia and the delisting uh, of the FARC, which demobilized uh, in 2016. And, and did you uh, uh, recommend that that delisting take place? The delisting recognizes the reality on the ground that the original FARC, if you will, um, which targeted me when I served in Colombia, uh, so I have no love for them, but they have participated uh, in the peace process since 2016. Uh, they have demobilized their structures while the FARC EP and the Segunda Marcatalia uh, have carried out uh, continued terrorist activities, uh, attacked uh, individuals, carried out bombings, uh, participated in drug trafficking, and we want to focus uh, on those who are uh, currently carrying out those illicit activities. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, the Bureau of INL, uh, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement was also consulted, and we came to the to the same conclusion. My time's almost up. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cardin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Let me thank both of our witnesses for their service to our country and our hemisphere. Our hemisphere has always bragged about having democratic states, and yet in recent decades, we've seen a decline of democracy, a decline of countries where they have free and fair elections so the people can have self-determination of their leaders. We see a growth of systemic corruption, as you've all pointed out, which denies the people of that country effective democratic governance. So it really is a critical moment. And I was listening to your response and I understand that you are collecting information. I know that you are using the different uh, legislative authorities that you have to identify uh, actors uh, for sanctions and uh, to use uh, country uh, activities uh, to express our concerns about the decline of democracy. But, but I just want to be clear. I mean, the chairman questioned about Cuba, questioned about many other countries. To me, the sanction that has gotten the most international attention is the Magnitsky sanctions. Other countries around the world have adopted similar regimes that we have to identify individuals for visa bans and for denial of the use of our banking system, which is really critical for those that participate in corruption. They like to travel and they like to hide their money in states that have rule of law. And if we can deny them that opportunity, it really uh, affects their ability to carry out their corrupt regimes. So I think we've got to be very clear about our commitment to use these sanctions. And I must tell you, I have not seen a robust use of the Magnitsky sanctions in our hemisphere. I've seen some, but I haven't seen a robust use. And that statute really... In, anticipates a collaborative effort between Congress and the administration on working together to identify and impose sanctions against those that are uh, committing these types of activities. President Biden has been very clear to identify corruption as the fuel uh, to undemocratic regimes. So. Can we be more open and robust so that it's a very clear message 
that those that are participating in corruption, uh, that they're going to be identified by the United States. If we don't have U.S. leadership, there is not going to be leadership in our hemisphere. We've got to take the lead. So why are, I understand there's a due process, I understand you've got to collect information, but we also have to be very clear about our willingness to identify those corrupt actors and impose tough sanctions against them individually so that they cannot benefit from their corruption. Why aren't we being more aggressive in this area? Uh, Senator, thank you for that very important question. And uh, from from my from from our standpoint, I, I think uh, you know again the administration has not been leaning back on this. I think they've been leaning forward, uh, but I, I think we have to recognize that you know sanctions are part of uh, uh, a kit that we can use to go after to not just go after those who are committing corrupt acts. But we have to we have to look at uh, other um, uh, tools that we can use, support for democratic institutions, making sure that we are. I agree uh, with you. I agree with you that we need to have the programs in place to support democracy and democratic institutions, and I strongly support those partnerships uh, through through the State Department. I agree with you, but you also have to. It's got to be a carrot stick. You, do you know how many Magnitsky sanctions have been imposed in our hemisphere in, in the last 12 months? I don't off the top of my head now. I think we're, we're over 40, I think. And how many are now under consideration? Uh, I can't tell you how many are currently under consideration, uh, but we look to aggressively deploy them uh, across uh, uh, all of the areas uh, where we see problems. And as you alluded to, Senator, uh, a key part of that is bringing along international partners. Uh, so when we're able to uh, enlist the European Union or Canada or the UK to also uh, apply sanctions, uh, to secure uh, supportive resolutions in multilateral organizations, that all increases the pressure uh, on the authoritarian and criminal regimes uh, in our hemisphere. I, I just conclude on this, uh, and I would ask for a commitment that you work with our staffs, with us as this committee, on the list that you're working on and the countries in which you're working on, because it's our impression that we could be more direct and visible on the use of these sanctions to make it clear that America's leadership is there. Uh, I understand we want to work with other countries, but it's critical that the United States takes the lead. And I would just ask your commitment that you would work with us and our staffs as we identify countries and individuals that we believe need to be considered for these types of sanctions. Absolutely, Senator. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rubin. Secretary Nichols, I, mean, I think you would agree that supporting democracy begins by supporting the existing democracies, to do nothing that undermines their strength or legitimacy. You would agree with that? Yes. Okay. And you would also agree, I believe, that Colombia is one of the strongest, most stable democracies and one of our best partners and allies in the region. That's a correct statement. Absolutely. Did we consult with them before we delisted the FARC? Yes. What was their take on it? So uh, this uh, has been part of the uh, implementation of the 2016 uh, agreement uh, between the government and the FARC, uh, the peace accord. Uh, and uh, from uh, Colombia's standpoint, the key element is for us to be able to deliver uh, assistance in areas where the FARC has demobilized. Uh, so that's the... Uh, but were they in favor or against the delisting? I, I don't want to characterize their position. They were in, certainly in favor of us providing uh, assistance for the uh, those who've demobilized and are participating in the peace process. They are also in favor of... Uh, us listing FARC EP and, and the Segunda Marcatalia. Okay. So, in, in terms of providing assistance to those who have demobilized and become politically engaged, is it not true that they wanted that assistance to be channeled through the Colombian government? We have a robust partnership with Colombia on these issues, and we work hand in hand with them. 
It's a great partnership. I understand, but isn't it true that what they wanted was not just to delist? They didn't want a delisting. What they wanted was to the extent that you're going to provide assistance to these people who have abandoned the guerrilla fight, laid down their weapons, become politically engaged. We want you to run that assistance through the democratically elected government of Colombia, not unilaterally. So um, certainly they and many governments that with whom we partner uh, have an interest in us providing direct budgetary support, um, but I think it's important for us to be able to implement the programs that uh, the Congress authorizes uh, that uh, USAID and other implementing agencies like INL uh, be able to directly uh, carry out the programming. Even if the carrying it out directly goes against the wishes of the democratically elected partner of that home country? Everything we do with our partners in Colombia is negotiated and agreed with the government of Colombia. So you're saying they agreed to this? They agreed to this agreement? This is what they wanted to see happen 100%? They, they sign an agreement on assistance programs, whether it's um, with USAID or with INL. No, no, no. Did, did, they, did they agree with the delisting and the direct delivery of aid to former FARC or FARC elements? Uh, I did not personally participate in that conversation. Who did? So is, that an, is this an NSC uh, process? Did, was the NSC lead on this? So our, our ambassador in, in Bogota, and it was crucial in this process. And um, again... Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't want to give the impression that there's any daylight between the government of Colombia and the United States. They're, they're superb partners. Okay. I, I think we'll hear from them on it. I can tell you, I know what their opinion on it is. They weren't in favor of the delisting, and they wanted to the extent aid to be provided to these people to be provided through them and not directly. But let me ask this, talk about the reality on the ground. So after this so-called peace process, there used to be, right, there's this FARC. The people who laid down their arms and became politically engaged have done so through a political party called Comunes, correct? Yes, sir. That group is not sanctioned. They're not, they're not on any list of foreign terrorist organization, right? They're not, deca- okay. And then the group that did not lay down their arms have gone on to become these dissident groups, FARC, dissident, FARC D and others, correct? Correct. Okay. We've sanctioned the group that became the dissidents. They've, we've added them to the list. And the people that are in the political party are no longer sanctioned because they're no longer part of FARC. They're now part of the political process. So who exactly are we delisting? What was the purpose of doing this? If, if the argument is that the peace process has dismantled the FARC, and now people that were in the FARC are either A, dissidents, who are covered under the new listing, or B, members of a political party who are not part of any sanctioned list, why did we do this? Uh, Who's not getting money as a result of this? Who is not a dissident group, who is not part of Comunas, and needs money from the United States that used to be or is a part of FARC? In order to carry out the uh, development programming uh, with a former members of the FARC, uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, delisting them was required. So the, wouldn't it have been easier to just say if you've abandoned the FARC and now joined Comunas, you're no longer considered a former. Wouldn't that have been easier to do and more straightforward and less confusing than delisting an entire group? Because a new group could start up tomorrow and say, we're the FARC, right? The dissident group could rename themselves and theoretically not be covered by this. Uh, the, the nomenclature uh, is covered in the way that we uh, address this. We name specific leaders uh, of these uh, FARC EP and Segunda Marcatalia, uh, their structures, subfronts, organizations, alternate names. Um, so it's well, we could have done the same by just naming the political party, as opposed to creating all this anxiety and, frankly, going under against the wishes of our democratically elected allies in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for your work and for coming before the committee today. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that President Trump's policy towards Venezuela was a failure. Um, the administration essentially decided to push all of our chips to the center of the table on the first hand, uh, recognizing Guaido ahead of many of our allies in the region and assuming that that would lead to the immediate collapse of Maduro's regime. That's not what happened, and there was no plan B. Uh, So we were uh, sort of stuck uh, for the next three years. So you have a lot of work to do to put together a policy that actually effectuates American 
aims in the region. On the question of sanctions, I just want to probe this with you a little bit more, um, Secretary Nichols, uh, because there's certainly a case to be made that uh, our sanctions can be effective, that they can weaken Maduro, that they can punish bad actors. But there is, of course, a flip side. Um, There's a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela today. There's a report from a few years ago suggesting that our sanctions have dramatically reduced caloric intake, increased disease and mortality, um, and um, had another, a number of other, um, you know, really serious and potentially catastrophic effects on the Venezuelan people. It also has the potential, our sanctions do, to um, provide fuel behind the anti-Americanism that um, is essential for Maduro to hang on to power. Um, so I've supported these sanctions um, because there's no shortage of individuals in Venezuela uh, who deserve them. Uh, at the same time, there are humanitarian consequences, and there frankly isn't a lot of evidence over the course of the last four to five years that those sanctions are actually weakening the Maduro regime. And so let me ask you about how you, you view both the upside and the downside of our existing sanctions policy and the prospect of additional sanctions. Thank you, Senator. The sanctions are an important tool in our quiver. And as Assistant Secretary Robinson uh, said, um, it's also important to have other tools uh, that we can uh, use to both uh, induce positive behavior and to dissuade people from um, taking uh, improper actions. Uh, We need to work to uh, balance and leverage all of those tools to the greatest extent possible. Uh, You know, I think the the suffering of the Venezuelan people owes much more to the horrible policies uh, of uh, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro, uh, which destroyed the economy, the healthcare sector, food production, retail sector, Um, and some six million Venezuelans have voted with their feet to leave that country. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I think those are, the, uh, those are the root causes of the suffering in Venezuela. But I also believe firmly that a negotiated process between the unitary platform and the Maduro regime is the best way forward, a process led by Venezuelans themselves, and we should be flexible and creative in supporting that process. So I, I, I agree. The, 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 the primary and proximate cause is the unconscionable, immoral leadership of the Maduro regime. Um, but our sanctions can be contributory, and they can provide uh, a diversion for Maduro so as to blame the economic suffering in the nation on us rather than uh, have it land on his shoulders. And I just hope that that is a consideration that we weigh. Um, I wanted to ask, Mr. Robinson, one question of you with respect to uh, gun violence and small arms proliferation in Mexico. Um, Despite um, increased troop deployments by the Mexican government to try to help address the violence, In that country, homicides have continued to rise. Uh, The statistics suggest that um, over 70% of the guns that are recovered at Mexican crime scenes originated in the United States. And earlier this year, the Mexican government went so far as to file a lawsuit uh, accusing American gun manufacturers of helping to fuel the rise in violence by knowingly flooding Mexico with firearms that are designed to end up in the hands of the cartels. Um, What is the administration doing to try to cut down on the flow of illegal uh, arms uh, and the arms trade into Mexico? Thank you, Senator. That question came up uh, earlier this year uh, during the the, uh, high-level security dialogue, uh, which I participated in 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 Mexico. Uh, And we have committed to working, we, my interagency partners, partners at DEA and, and FBI and Uh, ATF have committed to working more closely with Mexican officials uh, on uh, the the illegal arms trade uh, uh, and the uh, flows of arms uh, and money, frankly, uh, from the United States to Mexico. I look forward to working with you uh, on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Portman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me just say to both of you, thank you for your service and appreciate your comments today. 
Uh, Sister Secretary Nichols, you and I have had some good conversations regarding the kidnappings in Haiti, and I want to dig a little deeper into that today and find out where we are. I do appreciate your personal involvement in this. Uh, for those who don't follow this closely, um, there is an Ohio-based group, my home state of Ohio, uh, called Christian Aid Ministries that had uh, 17 people kidnapped in Haiti. It happened six weeks ago. Um, and typically, as I understand it, these kidnappings uh, result in some some resolution prior to that time. So I'm very concerned about it. Um, two hostages have been released. I guess that's encouraging. But of the remaining hostages, uh, the, the 15, there are children as well, one very young child. So again, I appreciate our conversations about it. Uh, this committee has expressed its concern on this. We actually passed an amendment last month requiring the State Department to work better on an interagency basis to coordinate efforts on kidnappings in, in Haiti and, uh, and to address the broader issue of violence. This criminal gang, the 400 Mawazu gang, uh, is responsible. And um, I've also spoken to the FBI director about this and, and made sure that we're doing everything we can to, from the law enforcement point of view to resolve this issue. Um, can you give me the status today, uh, what is being done um, by the State Department and by the U.S. government generally to rescue these missionaries? So uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, the issue of kidnapping for ransom in Haiti is a grave one. Uh, I believe uh, 41 uh, U.S. persons, uh, U.S. citizens, and, and uh, legal permanent residents have been uh, kidnapped uh, for ransom in Haiti in 2021. Uh, the um, embassy uh, country team, including uh, U.S. law enforcement agencies, uh, are cooperating with Haitian police authorities uh, to support a resolution of this case. Uh, it is one of deep concern. Uh, we saw the release of uh, two U.S. citizens who had been kidnapped uh, in connection uh, with that case, and, and we hope that there will be uh, a, a rapid resolution uh, and favorable resolution uh, for the remainder of those who have been uh, killed. Secretary Nichols, are you staying personally involved in this? Uh, I'm personally involved in it, and I'm in contact with our embassy in Port-au-Prince mm -hmm. on the situation every day. I appreciate that, and uh, is there anything you think we should be doing we're not doing? Uh, I would ask you to let me know. And uh, we will we will continue to help however we can uh, in terms of expressing our our deep concern. But we have to rely on people on the ground doing doing the right thing and making sure this is a priority. So I thank you for that. Let me change uh, to another topic, which is the the drug issue. Uh, we have a crisis right now, and a couple charts here have arrived just just in time uh, that I took to the floor of the Senate last night. But uh, I recently was on a congressional delegation with Senator Kane, who's here with us today, and we went to various countries in the region, including Ecuador, Colombia, Guatemala, and Mexico, met with the president of Mexico, and of course raised this issue. I think it should be the top issue in our bilateral relationship with Mexico today. Senator Murphy just mentioned the gun issue, totally related to this issue. These transnational criminal organizations are selling drugs in the United States, making a tremendous profit, and yeah, cash and drugs, uh, cash and guns are coming back into Mexico. And that means it's an issue for both Mexico and for us. Uh, in a very uh, significant way. So here's, here's the crisis, and it's, uh, it's pretty extraordinary. We've got 100,000 people who died in America of drug overdoses during the most recent 12-month period for which we have data, which would be April to April. It's probably worse than that now. That's a record. You know, that's more people than die from gunshot wounds and traffic accidents combined. Here's what's happening. The blue line is the number of overdose deaths related to fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid produced primarily now in Mexico. You can see we've gone from uh, 2015, the blue line keeps going up to 2020. In 2020, well over half of the overdose deaths in this country were from one drug, and that's fentanyl. Uh, also, crystal meth plays a role here, cocaine plays a role, other drugs that originate in Mexico as well. But this fentanyl issue is just overwhelming. And let's look at this next chart. You can see what's happening right now. On the U.S. border, we were told that last month there was a 42 percent increase in one month of fentanyl seizures. And what the Border Patrol agents will tell you privately is that they're not catching the vast majority of it. Um, here it is. Uh, 
seeing it from 2016, 2016 up to 2021, you can see the increase in fentanyl seizures. So we have a huge crisis. This is a killer drug, and it's not slowing down. Uh, people have supply chain issues in this country right now. Uh, the transnational criminal organizations do not have a supply chain issue. They're figuring out a way to do it. What specific steps, steps Mr. Nichols, have you asked the government of Mexico to take under the bicentennial framework for security to stop the flow of fentanyl and other illicit drugs into the United States? Uh, if I could, I'd like to ask my colleague, Todd Robbins. I'm, I'm going to ask him a question in a minute, too. Okay. So, uh, if I have time, we, which I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, together we, we met with Mexican authorities uh, and stressed the importance of coordinated intelligence-driven operations to take down drug trafficking networks, move away from the going after the capo-led uh, approach to one that takes down the entire networks, um, better intelligence sharing, better cooperation between uh, Mexican authorities and U.S. law enforcement, uh, we've already seen progress in that area in terms of closer cooperation, um, better access for our law enforcement uh, officials. Uh, as you know, fentanyl is smaller in size, cheaper to produce, and easier to smuggle. Uh, it's a very uh, tough nut to crack. Todd and I worked together on this issue when we were both in INL, uh, and uh, uh, we continue to work shoulder to shoulder with our Mexican colleagues to try and uh, defeat this problem. Well, my time has expired. I appreciate the indulgence. And, and Secretary Robinson, I'll follow up with you on what INL specifically is doing and whether it's a high enough priority. Uh, and, and Secretary Nichols, again, thanks for your personal involvement on the kidnapping issue. And i uh, sorry to take so much time. Thank you, Senator Portman. Senator Kane. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and to our witnesses. Thank you so much for your service. I want to talk about two things, Colombia and the Northern Triangle. So I agree with Senator Rubio's position that the first thing we should do is make sure we have strong relations with our allies and, and shore up democracies, and Colombia has been a great ally. Unlike some of my colleagues, I don't have a, a problem with the Biden administration's delisting of FARC. Um, today is the fifth anniversary of the peace deal that was done by, between the Santos administration and FARC. And I would hope that virtually everybody on the committee would view that as a historic achievement. President Santos won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. I think the U.S. deserves some significant credit for it. We were involved in those negotiations. Um, and I think the delisting, at the fi essentially at the five-year anniversary of the peace deal, was the right decision. The Colombian architect of the peace negotiation... Um, let's see. Sergio Jaramillo said, quote, for the Biden administration, this is a low cost thing to do. It sends the signal to the FARC. It's been five years. You've done your bit, behaved properly, and we're delisting you. The U.S. envoy who was involved in the peace negotiation, who's one of our finest diplomats, Bernard Aronson, said, Quote, if groups that were once violent revolutionary groups are never allowed to get off the list, that's one less incentive for them to make peace. You undermine incentives for other groups to renounce terrorism, renounce violent struggle. Um, so I think the decision to remove the FARC after five years of uh, participating in a new life and a new chapter in Colombian life, but designating groups like the FARC EP, like Segunda Marcatelia, and as far as I know, ALNA is still on the terrorist list, correct? So there's right. three Colombian groups who are carrying out terrorist activities that are on the list. I think it's the right thing to do, and I just wanted to start there. Let me go to the Northern Triangle. Um, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, I note that none of them have been invited to participate in the Summit for Democracy next week. Nicaragua has not been invited. Haiti has not been invited. Bolivia has not been invited. Venezuela has not been invited. Cuba has not been invited. But none of the Northern Triangle nations, we have invested billions and billions of dollars in this region, uh, and yet none of the Northern Triangle uh, nations have been invited to participate. I, I will just say parenthetically, with this summit coming up next week, I am a little bit surprised that no one I know in the Senate has, been, has received any outreach about what we think are topics that should be brought up in the summit. You know, and to be on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and to have surveyed my colleagues here and on the Intel Committee and on the Armed Services Committee and said, has anyone reached out to you about this summit for democracy? And so far, everyone's told me no. I'm a little surprised at that. There is going to be a summit for the Americas next summer 
August of 2022, the U.S. is hosting for the first time in 25 years. I would hope that those preparing for that summit might decide that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had some expertise and might want to reach out and, and get our ideas about it. But, but back to the Northern Triangle. Um, the elections in Nicaragua were a sham. Senator Rubio and I wrote a, a letter to you all, and I know Senator Merkley had one too, about concerns about elections in Honduras thus far. If I read the OAS reports, it, it looks like thus far maybe things are exceeding our expectations there. The, the count is not yet done, so we, we, we couldn't celebrate prematurely. Um, El Salvador has backslid after an, uh, the first election of a president who wasn't part of the FMLN or wasn't part of the right wing, you know, death squad groups from the past, promised that there might be a new chapter in Salvadoran life. The president of El Salvador is behaving like an authoritarian. And even maybe our best partner in the region, Guatemala, has backslid even since Senator Portman and I were there in July in terms of sacking anti-corruption prosecutors, and I gather that's the reason that they've not been invited to participate. This is a hugely important region to us. Much of the immigration crisis uh, at the border is being driven by instability in the Northern Triangle. Much of the drug trade that ravishes our communities is being driven by instability in the Northern Triangle. So talk to us a little bit about this particular part of the Americas and what the Biden administration hopes to accomplish there. Thank you very much, Senator. It's a critical part of the, uh, the region for us. I was in Honduras last week. I met with the leading presidential candidates. Uh, in every meeting, I urged uh, the importance of a peaceful, free, fair, transparent electoral process, talked to the press about that. Uh, and as you note, uh, it appears at, at this juncture uh, we've uh, achieved that, um, or I should, let me rephrase that, that the Honduran people have achieved that uh, with the support of the international community. Uh, the uh, region uh, is one that uh, has seen uh, drops in incomes over the past decade, uh, problems due to climate change, uh, challenges due to the gang-related violence, uh, and uh, above all, uh, intense acute corruption um, from key leaders uh, in the Northern Triangle. Uh, we're working to address all of those issues, and I think we've made uh, progress in that, but we still have a long way to go, and we're dealing uh, with uh, entrenched elites, political and economic elites, who do not see reform as their friend. Uh, and we need to push both using carrots and sticks uh, to encourage change. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, in Honduras we're going to see uh, the kinds of, of change that uh, we've been asking. Uh, the uh, leading candidate at this moment has stated her commitment uh, to attack corruption, uh, to deal with my, the causes and, uh, and drivers of migration, uh, and to promote jobs and better incomes in our country. And we look forward to working with her in that regard. Thank uh, you. I'm, my, my time is up, but I appreciate the answer. I'll yield it back um, to the chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. I understand that now we have Senator Young on WebEx. Uh, yes, Chairwoman, thank you so much, and uh, welcome, Ambassador thank you. Nichols. Can we turn this down a little bit? That's too loud. Okay, we are trying to get that done now. Sorry, Senator Young. Go ahead. Okay, how's that? Is that better? All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Ambassador Nichols, uh, previous administrations ha have rightly noted that the Caribbean is effectively a third border with the United States. I think of the time I served in the Marine Corps back in the 1990s as a member of a, a joint task force, and uh, I was operating on, on, on the southern border, uh, working in collaboration uh, with some other countries to uh, uh, deal with issues like illegal migration and drug trafficking. And of course, at the same time, we're promoting strong trading relationships with uh, countries in the Caribbean. But we're seeing a growing decline in democracy and governance uh, in that region. In, we've seen instability in Haiti lead to uh, migration and uh, pe persons descending on our own borders and, and fleeing chaos. Uh, we've seen authoritarian uh, governments uh, throughout the 
area, Cuba in particular, uh, that has continued its subversive activities. And then migration has, has destabilized many countries as populations have fleed economic stagnation and uncertainty. Uh, so, Mr. Ambassador, I, I just want to know, how does the administration view the Caribbean? Do you see it as a, a sort of sea-based third border with the United States? Uh, so, thank you, Senator. And uh, I just note that the Caribbean is a, a crucial partner for us in a crucial region, one where we need to stay engaged. Uh, the Bahamas is only 41 miles away from the United States. Uh, and... Uh, when we look throughout the, the Caribbean region, uh, we see countries that um, want opportunities, want to partner with us, face substantial challenges, uh, and our engagement, uh, our support, uh, uh, those things are going to be crucial for them to resist uh, the pressures that they're under, uh, both economic and political. To what extent does ongoing drug trafficking uh, in the Caribbean and the Northern Triangle countries undermine our democracy promotion programs? Uh, it's, it's a major challenge. Uh, I don't know if my colleague, Ambassador Robinson, wants to, to add to that. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, we know that, uh, that drug traffickers use the same routes, uh, that they're moving people, that they're moving guns, that they're moving money. Uh, uh, they, move, they move drugs. And, and so we see it as a significant uh, challenge uh, for us and uh, a threat to our, uh, threat to our national security. Um, uh, we have, fortunately, uh, a very good relationship with the governments in the Caribbean uh, and uh, work very closely with them on uh, training and equipment uh, to help us, to help them help us uh, uh, target uh, those routes and uh, and to to try to to keep the uh, the drugs from reaching our shores. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Nichols, uh, I know some of my colleagues have uh, asked questions pertaining to uh, China and how they're seeking to undermine democracy in Latin America. Uh, this was covered extensively by this year's report from the U.S. China. Economic and Security Review Commission. Do you believe the U.S. has a capability to counter China's efforts to undermine democracy in Latin America? And if not, uh, what else do we need so that we might uh, counter China's efforts? Uh, I think we do have programs? that capability, Senator, but we need to use all the tools available to us. I think the Development Finance Corporation uh, is an important tool that uh, gives us the ability to support private sector-led growth in the region. Uh, the uh, COVAX uh, consortium and our efforts to supply uh, COVID vaccines to countries in the region is vital. Uh, our presence uh, in the region is crucial in my travels and meetings with uh, over 20 uh, foreign ministers and governments since I've taken on my duties. Um, so, Mr. Amb Ambassador, I, I just regret my time's very limited here. Yeah. Does the administration have a strategic policy laid out for countering China in the region? You've just gone through a list. Is there actually mm -hmm. a written strategy? Uh, so we are uh, working uh, both within the State Department and the interagency uh, to sharpen our strategy for the region. Uh, and uh, it's an ongoing process within the department. Deputy Secretary Sherman is leading that effort. So will that be a written work product, which uh, you can share to me and other members of the committee? Yes. Okay, we will follow up and, and receive a time frame for that, unless you want to volunteer it to me. Okay. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here today and for your ongoing good work. Um, Ambassador Robinson, I would like to begin with you because New Hampshire, like Ohio, has a, a very difficult problem with substance misuse. And as I hear from law enforcement and our DEA agents, the majority of those drugs are coming across our southern border from Mexico. And so I wonder if, just to follow up on Senator Portman's question, what specifically are we doing with Mexico to try and address this problem because whatever we've been doing hasn't been working. Thank you, Senator. And, and I agree with you. I mean, there, there is nothing 
uh, more heartbreaking than what drugs like uh, fentanyl is doing uh, to our communities uh, across the United States. Uh, I was just in Mexico uh, along with my colleague, uh, Brian, uh, for negotiations uh, at the uh, high-level security dialogue. Um, we work very closely with the government of Mexico. They have agreed with us on uh, a number, uh, on an accord that lists a number of things that we're going to do, including uh, greater cooperation on intel exchange, uh, working more closely within the interagency with our partners in the interagency, the FBI, uh, DEA. Uh, they just agreed to uh, more visas for uh, DEA agents uh, uh, in Mexico. Um, but I think one of the aspects that we miss uh, that, that is not as public is the great work we do, uh, we INL and the interagency, with uh, the state uh, and local uh, Mexican, uh, state and local uh, governments in Mexico. Um, they clamor for greater opportunities to cooperate and collaborate with us on security issues, on um, equipment, on training. Um, so we are uh, trying to keep up with the demand. Um, the, the only, the last thing I would say is um, we have some work to do at home on this issue as well. Uh, if we can't get a, a handle on the demand side for these drugs. Clearly, I, I uh, certainly. You don't have to argue that with me. I would certainly agree with that. And we are working hard in New Hampshire, and I know in other states, to try and address that. So thank you very much. Um, Assistant Secretary Nichols, as a region, Latin America has among the highest rates of violence against women and girls in the world. Um, this, this has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course it's been exacerbated in Venezuela, where we've seen women and girls flee that country and um, be subject to um, sexual assault and other means of gender-based violence. Can you talk about what the administration's policy is to help support Venezuelan women and girls? So uh, our goal uh, is to uh, combat uh, sexual and gender-based violence throughout the hemisphere, but uh, migrants, and particularly Venezuelan migrants, are exceptionally vulnerable uh, to gender-based violence. Uh, we work to provide training to first responders. Uh, we partner with international organizations like the International Organization for Migration and the UN High Commission for Refugees uh, to provide support uh, to combat gender-based violence. Uh, we fund shelters um, along the migrant route as well as in a variety of uh, countries uh, in the hemisphere. Uh, we work with uh, gender champions, and uh, when I was ambassador to Peru, uh, I was very honored to work with Arlette Contreras, who won our International Woman of Courage Award while I was there. Thank you. Um, obviously, we have more work to do, but can you speak to the challenges that we face because we don't have ambassadors in a number of Latin American countries and what that means for our ability to enact foreign policy that's in the best interest of American citizens. An ambassador is crucial. Uh, they're the president's personal representative. They can deliver tough messages that no one else can. Uh, there are highest ranking officers who have a level of understanding and discernment uh, that informs Washington policy making uh, and their presence uh, also signifies the importance of the relationship and while not having an ambassador shouldn't be seen as a slight, um, that's often how it's perceived. And something that we certainly need to do everything we can to move forward in Congress and, and I would just like to point out, I had a recent case um, in my office where a New Hampshire citizen's daughter was in the hospital. She was having real issues with the hospital. And after they got a call from the embassy, um, the attitude in the hospital and the treatment of that family changed dramatically. So it's that kind of difference that our embassies and our ambassadors make in countries not only in Latin America but around the world. So hopefully we can get these people confirmed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Assistant Secretary Nichols, it's good to see you again. 
During your nomination hearing in May, you committed to working with me and this committee to curb illegal immigration and to address the root causes of this ongoing border crisis. I want to first ask you just a couple of basic questions. Yes or no answers will be fine. First, do you agree that to solve the border crisis, the United States needs policies and diplomatic agreements to discourage illegal immigration? Yes. And my second question, do you agree that making it easier to cross the border and remain in the United States tends to encourage people to come here illegally, all else being equal? We should encourage um, orderly legal migration while combating irregular migration. I, I agree with you on that. In May of 2021, I traveled to Guatemala and Mexico to meet with government officials about long-term strategies to address the border crisis. These officials told me that the key root cause of the crisis is that the Biden administration is sending a message that if you cross the border right now, you'll be allowed to stay in the United States. This message is being sent because the Biden administration canceled common sense policies like the migrant protection protocols, the remain in Mexico policy, policies and diplomatic agreements with Mexico that were hard negotiated by the previous administration. These policies required that persons crossing the border from Mexico and seeking asylum in the United States rather should remain in Mexico and not be released into the United States while their asylum claims are being adjudicated. This policy made sense to me, I think to many others. We shouldn't allow people who don't have valid asylum claims to enter the United States for any period of time. And if a migrant knows that simply by crossing the border, he or she can achieve indefinite release into the United States, often for years before their asylum claim is heard, or permanently if they simply decide not to show up, then that's an enormous incentive to cross the border right now. Yet despite court orders to the contrary, the Biden administration is still trying to terminate these policies and these diplomatic agreements that were so hard fought. So Ambassador Nichols, why, in the face of record illegal immigration, is the Biden administration terminating policies and diplomatic agreements that would otherwise serve to reduce migrants' incentive to illegally cross the border? The uh, migrant protection protocols is subject to ongoing litigation. Uh, the administration is committed to following the law and court orders. Um, I can't get into this in greater detail due to that ongoing litigation, but I will note that our cooperation with Mexico on the full range of migration issues is excellent. Uh, the first trip that I took was to Haiti, and among other things, I talked to the Prime Minister about migration issues. Uh, I accompanied Secretary Blinken to Colombia, where we had a regional migration conference to address um, illegal, irregular migration, to deal with issues related to the root causes, to promote uh, regular migration, right. to attack uh, trafficking networks, uh, and we're committed to following up and pushing on these issues every day. I've got it. I appreciate the meetings and the conferences, but I'll note this. The Biden administration is actually trying to undo these diplomatic agreements that were put in place and were working. I think it's very simple. Obey the law. That's what the Fifth Circuit has suggested. That's the proper answer here. Ambassador Robinson, I'd like to uh, turn to you, if I might. The fentanyl problem that's plaguing the United States is getting worse. We've talked about this, Senator Shaheen, uh, S Senator Portman. In Tennessee, overdose rates for individuals who are aged 25 to 34 have skyrocketed from 4.8 per 100,000 in 2015 to 37.6 per 100,000 in 2019. And every time I am home, I hear from local sheriffs that it's gotten much worse this year. The Memphis's Commercial Appeal, our, our, our large newspaper in our state, a few days ago interviewed Tennessee's former opioid czar, and he said, I quote, I can't remember the last time I've looked at a drug screening of a new patient coming off the street that didn't have fentanyl in it. Mexico is the major transit and production point for fentanyl, the fentanyl that's coming from China before it enters the United States. While direct shipments of finished fentanyl from China to the U.S. have declined after the Trump administration's crackdown, the amount of fentanyl shipped from Mexico has increased dramatically. And I've been told that more than 90% of that fentanyl crossing the border, or at least the chemicals that are used to make it, the precursors, comes from China. I mean, these drugs are killing Americans. Assistant Secretary Robinson, what percentage of the fentanyl coming across our border ultimately originates in China, including the precursor chemicals? Uh, I would say a great percentage. Uh, I don't have a specific number, but I would say a great percentage uh, comes from China. Well, I'll ask both Ambassador Nichols and Ambassador Robbins if you would commit to putting together an estimate for me and for this committee how much 
of this fentanyl coming from China? What percentage of it is coming from China, whether it's precursor or actual fentanyl, coming across the border into America annually? And how much of it specifically can be traced to China? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for uh, your testimony and for your service. Um, Secretary Robinson, a question with respect to Haiti. Um, I understand you had a trip there uh, recently, uh, and as you know, it's a, a death, desperate situation. Um, as I understand it, right now, gangs control about half of Port-au-Prince, um, hijacking fuel, kidnapping people for ransom. Uh, Senator Portman mentioned the 17 U.S. and Canadian missionaries that were abduct abducted, 15 who are still being held. Um, what is your uh, proposal as to what the United States can and should be doing right now with respect to the situation in Haiti? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Very, very important. Uh, as you noted, I was there uh, two weeks ago, I think. Uh, I had a chance, an opportunity to meet with uh, the uh, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Henri, uh, the acting Minister of Justice, uh, and the new uh, Director General of the Police. Um, we've also sent uh, advisors down to uh, assess the situation and look at mid to long term uh, uh, actions we can take in terms of advising on uh, setting up a new uh, uh, SWAT unit that will uh, directly uh, go after uh, uh, gang leaders uh, for prosecution either in Haiti or in the United States. Um, but it's, as you know, uh, much more complicated than that. Um, there are political parties, there are political and economic elites that support these gangs. We know this. We are uh, tracking, trying to track the money, uh, and we are going to use uh, every punitive measure we have uh, to go after the elites that are supporting these gangs and, and to go after uh, the money um, uh, of these gangs. Well, that, that raises a, a question. As you point out, a lot of the elites are uh, supporting the gangs. Uh, is there a risk of a, a coup essentially led by the gangs with the support of the elites? Um, and, and what measures are we taking to try to prevent that? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a risk of... Uh, <laughs> What I should say is there are many risks uh, in Haiti today. Um, after the assassination of the president, uh, uh, certainly anything uh, is possible. Um, but we believe that if we continue to work with the uh, current uh, government officials, uh, uh, the, certainly the current, uh, uh, the, the new director general of the police, um, if we can train them, if we can equip them, if we can uh, uh, give them the foundation they need to go after these gangs, uh, we, will, we will lessen many of those risks. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Secretary uh, Nichols, uh, there was an alarming uh, poll in The Economist uh, by a reputable polling organization that showed a, a big drop in the percentage of uh, Latin Americans uh, who believe democracy is important to their future. I think they said 49%, so just less than half of the population. Uh, you see a number of trends uh, in the region uh, where uh, people are sort of cracking down or preventing independent judiciary uh, and a number of other concerning developments. Uh, and in the case of Brazil, uh, you have the current a president uh, who has essentially stated that um, he'll either be killed or he'll win in the next election, and there's been concern expressed about whether or not the elections uh, next year uh, will be free and fair uh, and accurately counted. Um, can you talk a little bit about your assessment of the situation in Brazil? So Brazil's an important partner. It's a, a country with whom we have robust uh, dialogue and exchange. National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, has been there. Their National Security Advisor has visited us. Uh, we'll have a, a number of high-level uh, visits and engagements uh, early in the new year, uh, Omicron variant 
permitting. And uh, one of the topics that we discuss is uh, democracy uh, in, the, uh, in the hemisphere and the importance of jointly working to continue uh, to build democracy in our hemisphere. Um, and we stress that we've seen challenges in our own nation, uh, as you well know, Senator, uh, and they need to take steps to ensure that their institutions can meet any tests that are put before them. Uh, just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect to the elections next year, do you expect them to uh, be conducted in a free and fair manner, or do you have concerns as of the present moment? Uh, I believe that they will be conducted in a free and fair <coughs> manner, uh, and I believe that uh, Brazil's institutions uh, will meet the test. Uh, but every nation, and again, we've seen this in our own country, every nation has to strengthen its institutions because they are not only uh, weakened by cynicism and corruption on the inside in many cases, but they're also being attacked from outside our hemisphere uh, very actively, and we need to be cognizant of that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Nichols, I'd like to start with Mexico. Uh, I am increasingly concerned that the Mexican government is engaged in a systematic campaign to undermine American companies, and especially American energy companies, that have invested in our shared prosperity and in the future of the Mexican people and economy. Over the past five months, Mexican regulators have shut down three privately owned fuel storage terminals. Among those, they shut down a fuel terminal in Tuxpan, which is run by an American company based in Texas, and which transports fuel on ships owned by American companies. This is a pattern of sustained discrimination against American companies. And I worry that the Mexican government's ultimate aim is to roll back the country's historic 2013 energy sector liberalization reforms in favor of Mexico's mismanaged and failing state-owned energy companies. The only way the Mexican government is going to slow and reverse their campaign is if the United States government conveys clearly and candidly that their efforts pose a serious threat to our relationship and to our shared economic interests. I hope that the Biden administration is willing to do that, and I want to ask you some questions about that specifically. What leverage do you believe the United States government has, and what leverage should we use to secure a course correction in Mexico's behavior? So we have an incredibly complex and rich relationship with Mexico. Uh, we have a structure for that relationship under the USMCA. Uh, and uh, the integration of our energy uh, markets in North America and our supply chains in North America is critical. We're Mexico's largest trading partner. Uh, and uh, thousands and thousands of Americans and Mexicans cross the border every day um, as part of that relationship. Uh, How concerned are you? about the Mexican government's behavior, and in particular, their targeting of American companies? The, uh, I don't believe that the, the Mexican government is targeting American companies. I think the other point that you made about consolidating uh, the energy sector uh, in, in public hands rather than private hands is, is more the issue. So you not, believe they're targeting just all private energy companies, Mexican and American? Yes. Yeah, is I, that a good thing for America? Is that so, a good thing for Mexico? Uh, I believe that we need to talk uh, in a comprehensive way with our Mexican partners about the importance of energy security and how the private sector is vital to maintaining energy security. Let me try again, America. Mr. Nichols. In, in your judgment, would Mexico destroying the private energy sector in Mexico and nationalizing or throwing out American companies and moving everything to the corrupt and failing state-owned energy companies, would that be a good thing for Mexico and would that be a good thing for America? It's important that we talk to Mexico about uh, a future of reliable energy, 
uh, a, a future where our energy markets can remain integrated, where the private sector plays a, a leading role, particularly in working together to ag uh, achieve uh, you, you know, I our have, top I have to say, Mr. Goals. Nichols, that your answer is discouraging because if you're not willing to tell me candidly that Mexico nationalizing energy and, and targeting, uh, targeting American companies is a bad thing, then I have even less confident that you're willing to convey that to Mexico. Let, let me shift to another country, uh, Colombia. This morning, the Biden administration removed the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, from the list of foreign terrorist organizations. The FARC is an organization of Marxist-Leninist narco-terrorists. For decades, they have killed, they've kidnapped, they've extorted Colombians. They have murdered and seized American citizens. They continue to pose an acute threat to Colombian security and to American interests across the region. This is sadly a... a part of a pattern of Biden foreign policy when it comes to dealing with terrorists. And it is a pattern of appeasement and weakness towards terrorists. It's a pattern we've seen with the Taliban and the absolute disaster in Afghanistan. It's a pattern we've seen with the Houthis in Yemen, where again, the Biden administration lifted sanctions on them. And it's a pattern that has led to disaster. Given that appeasement didn't work with the Houthis in Yemen, given that it didn't work with the Taliban in Afghanistan, why does the administration believe that weakness and appeasement and delisting the FARC as terrorists will produce anything but terrible results in Colombia? What makes you think weakness towards these terrorists is going to be successful? Thank you, Senator. The administration is focused on the current terror threat. We designated the FARC EP and the Segunda Marcatalia, uh, the two active elements that are carrying out terrorist attacks. We continue to have a $10 million reward for alias Ivan Marquez, the head of the Segunda Marcatalia. Marcatalia. Uh, we are focusing uh, on supporting the peace process five years in and those elements uh, of the okay, prior uh, final FARC question because my time has expired. Mm -hmm. If and when the FARC responds to being delisted with more violence and more terrorism, will you commit to coming before this committee and admitting that it was a mistake to <laughs> pretend they weren't terrorists and it was a mistake for President Biden to delist them today? I'm always available to appear before this committee. Thank you very much. Senator Merkley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador Nichols. Uh, thank you for uh, your service. Um, and I particularly want to focus on Honduras. Uh, we have uh, the early returns uh, favoring the Libre Party and the, the woman who, who ran against corruption. Many people see this as a referendum on corruption in Honduras. Uh, but there's a lot of concern that yesterday the, the counting was suspended for 10 hours uh, and that the counting is uh, not disclosed for the National Assembly, their, their Congress. Uh, we know this is a nation that has had military coups in the past, including um, Ms. Castro's husband, who was ousted by a coup in, in 2009. But there is an opportunity here, an incredible opportunity, that it is the United States has to seize it uh, with both hands and to send a powerful uh, message that no military coup will be, be tolerated because if one could happen a week from now. The power elites uh, are deeply entrenched. The corruption extends to the, the mayors, the legislators, the police, the military, all the way down. No one should underestimate how difficult it is when this type of corruption permeates every level of authority in the country right down to gangs that control street vendors. Uh, so um, uh, it's um, a possibility, but, but a, a challenging moment. Uh, and um, I'd just like to hear uh, what measures the State Department is taking uh, to make sure, A, there's not a military coup, second, that the counting is completed in an honest fashion, third, that there's not shenanigans that occur with the, the National Assembly trying to undermine her ability to get anything uh, done. And I must say I am impressed uh, that she campaigned on restoring the international corruption investigators, uh, MASI, uh, which was uh, uh, the, the, the team that started to finally tackle corruption at its highest levels in Honduras and that the previous president and its allies shut down. She's promising to bring them back. She's promising to address inequality uh, that is uh, at the foundation of the deep desperation of millions of Hondurans and helps drive 
uh, migration and when, the, when President Biden's team talks about root causes, therefore uh, we're, she's talking about root causes. So what are we going to do to make the most of this rare moment of uh, promising opportunity? Thank you, Senator. This time last week I was in Honduras. I met with Xiomara Castro and Tito Asfora, uh, and had uh, meetings with a foreign minister, a public security minister, defense minister, chief of defense, uh, talked about the importance of free, fair, transparent elections uh, and the importance of a peaceful process where everyone respects the outcome. Uh, met with the National Electoral Council, talked about their vital role in ensuring a free, fair, transparent uh, and peaceful process. Uh, following my meetings with them, both of the leading candidates put out statements reiterating their commitment to res respect the results and encouraging their supporters uh, to remain patient uh, and peaceful throughout that process. Uh, we have uh, embassy observers on the ground in Honduras who uh, also partnered uh, with the Organization of American States uh, and there was an EU electoral observation mission uh, through USAID. We supported um, a civil society uh, broad uh, umbrella effort to observe the elections. Uh, there are uh, observers who are with the Electoral Council um, taking a look at the, the actual vote counting process. There were, uh, as I think you noted, some technical issues uh, in the vote count process, but there are international observers at every stage looking at how that's working. Uh, the uh, let, let me cut to the chase here, because I that's those conversations were fine and and good. I'm glad you sent those messages. Are we conveying that there will be significant, powerful consequences if there is a military coup or if the voting is? The count is, is, is suspended or corrupted in some form here at the, the last moment to try to give a, a new assembly and a new president a real, a real chance to enact reforms. Are we, are, and if so, what, are, what is that message we're sending, if, if you're at free to, to, uh, to share? So, in my con again, in my conversations with uh, the leading officials, um, including the defense minister, the foreign minister, the chief of defense, and the minister of public security, um, they reiterated to me their commitment to free, fair elections and uh, respecting the result. Um, if there were some violation of, of that commitment, um, that would be unacceptable. And we have the Inter-American Democratic Charter, we have the Organization of American States, uh, and we have um, uh, ample confidence that uh, all parties are going to respect this outcome. Okay, well, I, uh, uh, my time's up, so I'll just conclude by noting that uh, people always give assurances until the moment a military coup starts or the counting is suspended and not resumed. I'm specifically encouraging that we send a very strong message that there will be concrete consequences should this fail to happen, which is different than a positive, just a positive encouragement, uh, because uh, we've seen this go off the rails many times before, and, and we should be absolutely there accelerating the return of the international investigators that, that she has called for as, as soon as she is in, in office. I, I hope the National Assembly will be one that, that she can, can work with. If not, none of her reforms will be able to, uh, to move through. Uh, this, it, it is extraordinarily frustrating to see how the corruption is infiltrated throughout every level, again, clear down to the street level, and how difficult it is to reform, and all of our root causes strategy won't work when a society operates on that complete 100 percent corruption from top to bottom. Thank you. Uh, Senator Booker is with us virtually. Thank you, Chairman Menendez. Uh, I appreciate um, uh, both uh, Mr. Nichols and uh, Mr. Robinson being here, and I want to jump right in. I know this issue was discussed uh, a little bit earlier, but I'd like to get back to it. Reports uh, really suggest that both China and Russia are engaging in an active uh, propaganda and disinformation campaign in Latin America, uh, as they, they're doing in other parts of the world, obviously, but China and Russia have really sought to undermine uh, the democratic values and damage uh, the overall reputation of the United States. And so I'm wondering, what is the State Department's Global Engagement Center doing uh, to counter uh, the Chinese and Russian government's different disinformation in Latin America and the, Car the Caribbean. 
and what more could the uh, could the GEC do uh, in the future? Thank you, Senator. Uh, our focus is um, ensuring that one we identify where uh, you know the negative messaging trolls are coming from. Uh, that we work with friendly governments to alert them to what the realities are, that we actively message uh, the reality of, of the situations that um, we're facing, um, that we have uh, very direct and comprehensive conversations with governments in the region as well as civil society and publics uh, about the realities of, of what the presence of um, uh, PRC, Russia, uh, others uh, in the region, uh, and we need to also offer a positive uh, alternative, whether it's um, 5G technology or whether it's um, support for infrastructure projects. We're actively working to make sure that countries know that there are alternatives available to them uh, and that we will work with them to put, the, put together a package that works for their nation. And Mr. Nichols, can you, can you just be a little more uh, specific about the tactics of the GEC? What are some of the specific uh, activities they're doing and, and what more would you like to see them do? So uh, the Global Engagement Center um, both measures a public opinion and uh, social media trends throughout the world. Um, they actively work to counter false messages from uh, our strategic competitors, uh, and they prepare um, media products or talking points that our embassies and consulates uh, around uh, the hemisphere can use to combat disinformation. Um, I think they do a great job. Um, obviously, it's a huge task, um, so the, the resources that they have to bring to bear to this um, limit somewhat the ability to accomplish those goals, but um, I think they're doing vital, vital work. Um, just jumping really quick to Haiti, and I, I heard at least one of my colleagues bring up uh, the uh, severe issues that are going on there. We are in a state of uh, extreme crisis, and uh, the democracy there is really faltering as violence is uh, 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 sort of almost at pandemic levels throughout the country, uh, not to mention the challenges with the natural disasters that they that we've seen there. Uh, I just want to know, uh, maybe overall, what's your sense of hope uh, in in Haiti, and um, and how effective is the U.S. strategy uh, uh, there in countering uh, some of these both natural uh, disasters as well as uh, the faltering of the democracy and and the endemic violence. Thank you for that question, Senator. The situation in Haiti is a critical challenge for our hemisphere. Um, Haiti faces uh, collapsed government institutions, deep political polarization, criminal and gang violence, um, lack of economic progress. Uh, we are working together with our partners uh, around the world uh, to try and support the Haitian people at this crucial moment and, and to uh, promote a Haitian-led solution to those challenges. Um, that promotion means our advocacy and encouragement on the ground, the leadership of our charge, Ken Merton, uh, that involves uh, interaction at high levels, uh, uh, be it Secretary Blinken or other senior officials uh, in uh, Washington, and, and collaboration with international partners like Canada, uh, France, Brazil, uh, to support Haiti. And then lastly, a few seconds left. I continue to be dissatisfied with the level of diversity uh, at the State Department. And I know there's a lot of good efforts going on to try to get more diverse and inclusive uh, members, uh, employees at the State Department. And um, I myself have worked with other senators to try to do things from sponsoring internship programs and uh, uh, other fellowship programs. But I'm curious if you have any advice for me uh, who just, uh, especially as I travel the globe and visit with our State Department, so I'm, I'm surprised at the lack of diversity. I wonder if you have any advice to me about what more we could be doing to promote diversity within the State Department. Uh, I think recruiting uh, is the first crucial step. Uh, I think the fellowship programs, Wrangle and Pickering, are vitally important. I think retention is crucial, and uh, in our bureau, uh, we have a 
uh, several parallel programs to support retention of a diverse workforce. Uh, we have a senior foreign service officer who actually led the department's recruitment efforts, Marianne Scott, who leads our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, efforts from the front office and um, works not only uh, to support that in Washington, but also in all of our embassies and consulates around the world. Uh, I think if you talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion, uh, when you visit our embassies and with foreign partners, uh, I think that definitely helps. And uh, I hope that you will uh, support our recruiting efforts uh, in universities and colleges around America. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Maki. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, uh, I, to you, uh, Ambassador Nichols, uh, just want to talk about, in following up on uh, Senator Booker's questioning on Haiti, uh, just want to make sure that the actions which we're taking in Haiti aren't solidifying opportunists over the um, interests of the Haitian people. And I saw where you met with representatives of the Montana group made up of Haitian citizens and civil society leaders in late September. Uh, what were your takeaways from that meeting in terms of how the United States should move forward with an inclusive Haitian-led focused policy? So my number one takeaways uh, are, number one was the importance of security. Um, we, we need better security to be able to get to free and fair elections in Haiti, and we're a long way away from that. Uh, the role of civil society in its broadest construct, private sector, non-governmental organizations, is vital. Uh, and uh, bringing together a broad set of actors uh, to agree on a way forward um, without an artificially imposed timeline from the international community uh, is also vital. Um, those would be my main takeaways, sir. Thank you. And I just urge you to continue to reach out to those civil society leaders in Haiti because ultimately uh, they have the vision which is going to be necessary uh, to, uh, to just change this underlying historical dynamic which exists there. So uh, thank you for your good work. Uh, but uh, let's just uh, continue to focus upon that community of leaders who are risking their lives every day uh, to try to provide uh, the uh, long-term uh, vision for what has to happen there. Um, on absolutely. the subject of, uh, yes, sir. I just absolutely, Senator. Yeah, thank you. On the on the subject of uh, climate change, uh, the science is clear on the fact that climate change is an underlying driver of widespread humanitarian crisis and displacement throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Therefore, I reintroduced legislation this year that aims to create a U.S. resettlement pathway for climate-displaced persons, uh, given the United States bears an outsized responsibility for fueling global warming. Still, the majority of the CO2 is red, white, and blue after 200 years of uh, leading the Industrial Revolution. And I was glad to hear that in response to my persistent calls for action on this topic, there is now a National Security Council interagency working group aimed at finding solutions uh, to issues of climate migration. Do either of you have anything more you can share on the progress of this interagency working group and what potential solutions might be offered? Thank you, Senator. I have not participated directly in, in that specific conversation, but I can tell you that climate change uh, and its effects on the countries in our hemisphere is a central concern that I have. Uh, I had the pleasure of participating with Vice President Harris in her meeting with Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados, and that was a key topic in that conversation. Uh, we are uh, integrating climate issues into all of our diplomatic engagement throughout the hemisphere, and we are actively focused uh, on uh, mitigation uh, measures for those states most at risk, uh, as well as adaptation, particularly in the energy sector. Yeah, well, I would uh, urge you to uh, continue to stay very engaged on this uh, very important issue. Uh, we have to tackle the issues of climate resiliency uh, and solutions for climate displaced persons, which is just going to increase as each year goes by. Uh, and if we're doing that, we're actually working on one of the underlying drivers of mass migration coming out of Latin America, coming out of the Caribbean. So I just urge you to continue to 
elevate it as an issue, uh, to drive it uh, at the National Security Council as an issue that um, has to be addressed and factored into all of the uh, resultant issues that uh, are a consequence of our long-term long, uh, um, uh, ignoring uh, of the climate crisis. Absolutely, Senator. So Senator, I, think I, I, I would just add, uh, it's, uh, it's even more broad than that. Uh, econo the environmental degradation from narcotics trafficking uh, throughout the region is also a major problem, and uh, we are both working very closely with our partners in the region. We've seen the effects of illegal mining. We've seen the effects of, of runoff from waste from, from uh, drug trafficking uh, or drug production areas in Mexico and in uh, Colombia, and we are working to, to raise that as well. Thank you. Thank you both for your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Let me have some final closing questions. Uh, let me start off with Haiti. I, I, a lot has been discussed here, but the, here's the one thing I don't understand. Haiti, obviously, uh, is a challenge, number one, because of the suffering of the Haitian people by both natural and man-made disasters. Uh, it is destabilizing to its neighbor that it shares the island of Hispaniola with the, the Dominican Republic. We have seen, uh, if, if one is facing the challenges that the Haitian citizens are facing, fleeing the island is clearly maybe a desirable alternative. That means uh, uh, migration to in the hemisphere and to the United States. So these are real tangible challenges we are facing right now. I've heard your answers about our overall goal of a Haitian-led uh, democratic process. I share that. But when Doctors Without Borders are closing up because they can't get fuel to operate their circumstances, when I'm getting calls from orphanages that Americans sponsor who want to close up the orphanages and bring the children to the United States because they can't secure them, when people are sequestered uh, and kidnapped, uh, it seems to me that none of that can happen in terms of our aspirations for Haiti unless there is security. So what is our initiative to try to create some uh, semblance of security so that all these other things can happen? Thank you, Senator. That's a, 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 a great question. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, it's a complicated issue. Uh, we are, we, INL, are working very closely with the Haitian National Police, the new Director General. We are uh, going to send inv advisors. When I was there uh, two weeks ago, I arrived with, uh, they had asked for greater uh, ability to get police around the city. We, I showed up with uh, 19 uh, new vehicles, uh, 200 new uh, protective vests for uh, for the police, we are the 19 was the first installment of a total of 60 that we are going to deliver to the Haitian National Police. We're going to get advisors down there to work with the new SWAT team to start taking back the areas that have been taken from ordinary Haitians. Uh, but it's going to be a process, and uh, and it's going to take some time. Well, first of all, uh, is the Haitian National Police actually an institution capable? of delivering the type of security that Haitians deserve? We believe it is. It's, a, it's an institution that we have worked with in the past. Uh, there was a small, brief moment where uh, Haitians actually uh, acknowledged that the Haitian National Police had gotten better and was more professional. Our goal, our long-term goal, is to try to bring it back to that. So how much that time sense. before we get security on the ground? I, I can't say exactly, but we are working as fast as we can. Months, years. Uh, I well, I I would hope we could do it in less than months, but we we're, we're we're working as fast as we can. Well, here's the problem. I don't understand why there is a reticence uh, to, for example, seek uh, UN uh, action to try to create stability because <clears throat> nothing else. When when the gangs control the ports. And everything you try to get to the Haitian people are stopped at the ports because the gangs control it. Something is wrong. How do you do all the things we want to do to help the Haitian people if at the end of the day you can't get through the gangs? 
Well, we're absolutely going to need, as you as you rightly point out, we are absolutely absolutely going to need the the help of uh, international organizations. Um, we were a little bit stymied uh, in this uh, just recently when we tried to extend the mandate of the current group of. Uh, police advisors. Uh, we wanted to get them extended for a year, but we were blocked by uh, Russia and China, uh, and they were only able to be extended for for nine months. Um, but it's going to collect. It's going to take a collective effort. Yeah. And why do you uh, think Russia and China stopped us? Because they want they want total unrest in the hemisphere. That's their whole purpose in this hemisphere, is creating instability is to move people to a, a point of saying democracy doesn't work, let me try something else, authoritarianism. Absolutely. And they systematically work at it. At some point, we, we have to think about how we, we circumvent that. Let me turn to something else. Secretary Nichols, uh, uh, in the trafficking in persons report that the State Department put out, Cuban doctors were listed as among an ent a, a group of people who were trafficked. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, uh, when an entity like PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization uses Cuban doctors in a way that allows them to be trafficked. Shouldn't we be doing something to change that at Pajo? We've had uh, strong conversations with the leadership of Pajo uh, about the unacceptable nature of, of that relationship. Uh, we've talked about uh, the importance of, of better governance and oversight within that organization uh, and that uh, in order for us to work with PA, we need to be assured that something like that can never be repeated. Well, they continue, though. Uh, for example, right now, Cuban doctors are, are being used inside of Mexico uh, in a way in which they are being trafficked. Uh, how is it, uh, you know, uh, I understand that trafficking in persons uh, by a country ultimately is a violation of the USMCA. So we talked to uh, all countries uh, about the, uh, the reality of the Cuban medical missions program and uh, that uh, it's a massive trafficking risk and we encourage countries uh, to avoid it. Uh, it is a, uh, it's an abuse of uh, the Cuban people uh, and it's uh, a misguided attempt to provide health care. But, uh, but when a country engages in it, knowing that, then there has to be some type of consequence. I mean, for those who might be viewing, I don't understand what we're talking about. Uh, Cuba sends doctors to different countries in the world. They ultimately, have, those countries pay the Cuban government uh, for the service of those doctors. Those doctors get a fraction of their wages and their passports are taken away so they can't leave. That's human trafficking. And it's being done uh, right here in our hemisphere with international organizations like PAHO and done with countries who supposedly we have a relationship with like Mexico. And, and, and there has to be consequences to it or else we are complicit in the trafficking. Let me ask you, um, with reference to Nicaragua and El Salvador, uh, Secretary Nichols, we can agree that in case of Nicaragua, we have a new dictatorship arising, and in the case of El Salvador, we have dramatic backsliding in democracy. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Uh, so both of them are part of uh, uh, DR CAFTA. Should we be considering suspending them as a action that is a strong action to be taken so that uh, we can hopefully turn the tide? I think we should be thinking about all the tools that we have available to us. Um, there is uh, a, an urgency to demonstrate to countries in the region that actions have consequences. The, the ability of countries to flaunt their own constitutions, their own laws, to abuse their own citizens is a huge problem and we should use every tool available uh, to well, I, I think that part of the tools, one of the strongest tools you can do is take away trade preferences. When we entered DR CAFTR, it wasn't uh, with countries that were moving in the opposite direction from democracy. They were moving towards democracy. 
Uh, they were moving towards a respect for human rights. They were moving towards a respect for the rule of law. They should not be able to benefit from trade preferences when they go in the opposite direction. That's a strong action the administration can take, and I recommend it to them. Let me ask uh, uh, Secretary Robinson, uh, while the United States has uh, traditionally stood with principled activists and public officials that seek to reverse democratic backsliding, uh, combat uh, kleptocracy and uphold the rule of law, uh, those courageous individuals often face uh, significant threats as a result of their work. Uh, far too often, these individuals are forced to flee their countries when the situation becomes untenable or when they finish their term in office. Now, I know you're familiar with these dynamics. What more does the United States need to do to support those individuals who stand against efforts to undermine democratic governance? How can we address the challenge, for example, in Central American countries where the problem is particularly acute? Thank you, Senator. That, that is a really important question. And I would say, you know, we, we need to look at a, a basket of uh, ways that we can uh, uh, support and defend democracy in, in Central America and, frankly, throughout the region. We need to continue uh, to use all of our sanctions authorities and, and vigorously use our sanctions authorities. We need to continue to work with those governments uh, to shore up their, uh, their democratic institutions, independent uh, attorneys general, uh, judiciaries, uh, the courts, uh, prosecutors. We need to, to continue to work very closely uh, with, these, with these organizations. Um, we need to find more flexible and, and creative ways to support civil society and uh, independent media in country so that they, you know, they, they don't, it's not easy to, to make them flee uh, when they stand up and do the right thing uh, for democracy, for investigating uh, corrupt acts. Um, uh, uh, and and I, I, I'm, uh, I look forward to working with, uh, with you all on finding these flexible and creative ways to do, to do that. Um, but it, I, I would say the, the last thing we need to do is we need to uh, be more vigorous on protecting and offering uh, a safe haven for those who do have to flee. Uh, it's, it's a cumbersome process now. It's very hard for, there are four uh, courageous people, at least four courageous people from Guatemala that are being hosted here. There are probably others from the region. It was hard to get them here. And, and, and again, uh, I, I look forward to working with, with you all to figure out uh, better ways, more efficient ways that we can offer uh, 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 some se semblance of safety. Well, we would certainly want to work up. with you on that and other issues. Let me just say, though, when the corruption fighter has to leave the country, there's one less person to try to create change. Absolutely. And so at the end of the day, we, we have to find ways to strengthen their hand, to create international spotlights on what they're doing, to make it more difficult for regimes to threaten them and ultimately cause them to leave. Because uh, th for them, for the regime, that's ultimately a success story, right? This person leaves, and now there's one less person to try to create change in the country. Senator, I would also add that uh, we saw the model that worked. Um, I can't remember who mentioned it, but uh, I think it was Senator Merkley mentioned uh, Mozzi in Honduras. Uh, we had international organizations in some of these countries that were working, and and the reason they're not there now is because they touched uh, people in those countries in power who had never been touched before. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can look at that uh, again, uh, we might have some more success. Finally, uh, Secretary Nichols, where did the idea for dis delisting the FARC come from? Uh, it's been something uh, under discussion since uh, at least the previous administration. Uh, it's, uh, it was always contemplated as part of the peace accord. Uh, you may recall that uh, when the Uribe administration reached an agreement uh, with the AUC paramilitaries, that organization was also delisted. Yeah. And, but more recently, where, 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 well, who drove the question of delisting the farm? Uh, well, it's... Was uh, it NSC? Was it State Department? Who, who, who was it? Uh, I, I believe that this was a... It was when I arrived in the position that was already well advanced, so I can't say 
who the specific driver was. It was always a, uh, a component of our support for the the peace process uh, and updating the threats that we face. Well, my understanding is that what you're doing is sanctioning those who have not put their arms down and uh, delisting those that have and are following a peaceful path to integration in their society. Uh, but uh, this is an example of when I've pressed the question, both in nominations and with the administration, about consultation versus notification. And in this particular case, my notification was to the Wall Street Journal. That is not what I consider consultation. And the lack of getting that type of consultation creates problems. So I hope we don't relive it again. This hearing uh, uh, record will remain open to the close of business uh, tomorrow. Members who have questions will submit it by then. We would like your answers to be expeditious and as full as possible. And with that, uh, and the thanks of the committee, this hearing is